for watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game. Although today we won't be doing so much politics, we will be doing more public policy, because we are taping this in the office of Professor Kevin Murphy at Sci Hall, which is a new building that houses the Department of Economics at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park, and also houses Becker, the Becker Friedman Institute, and also houses, most importantly, the office of Kevin Murphy. Kevin is one of the last two, I would say, of the Chicago School of Economics. Would that be correct? I I'm certainly consider myself in that lineage. I don't know if I'm the last. Hopefully not well, the last. <laughs> that means hopefully it's an ongoing <laughs> legacy. Hopefully. You, Casey Mulligan, but okay. But we'll come back to you. Some of you would know about the Chicago School of Economics. We will elaborate on that during the show. In my view, somewhat biased, the most, one of the most important public policy generators, the Chicago School of Economics in the 20th century. I would say from 1920 to 2000, nothing more important. Some would say it was 1955 to 1975. But Kevin Murphy, you are the distinguished service, distinguished service professor of George J. Stigler, distinguished service professor of economics. So you are picking up, as you say, the lineage of the Chicago School, of Milton Friedman, of Gary Becker, of George Stigler, and on and on. And you've been looking at inequality, right? Uh, that's one of the areas I've studied, yes. Most recently, it's one of the, it's publicly people are saying, we know there's too much inequality. We know it's gotten worse. This is what people say. We know CEOs, Fortune 500, they make mega bucks. I don't know, 100 million, 300 million, <laughs> What not 300 million, but well, I don't know, way too much. As people say, they would make 400 times what a, a CEO makes, maybe 400 times what a salaried person makes. Can you justify that? And is that a part of what you're looking at for inequality? Uh, actually, I haven't focused that much on what's going on with the CEOs, and and I think that actually just detracts and gets away from where the key issues are. I, I think the facts are. There's been an, a large growth in inequality, and it's not limited to the very high end of the income distribution. In fact, differentials across different segments of society have widened dramatically, whether I'm looking at the very top versus everyone else or at the very bottom versus the middle. So what, mean, do you, what do you mean by inequality? When you say, number one, has inequality gotten, has inequality grown over the last 20 or 30 years. Is there more inequality now than there was, say, in 1990? And how do you measure it? And what would you, is it good, bad? Should something be done? I would say a couple things. One is I wouldn't start in 1990. In Where fact, the greatest growth in inequality was during the 1980s. Okay. So that was the biggest decade of growth in inequality in the United States. I would say the growth in inequality roughly starts about 1970, accelerates quite a bit starting into the 80s, and really the, you know, has increased every decade since about roughly 1970. So that's almost 50 years now that we've seen widening inequality in the United States. For 50 years. It's Close not, to 50 years. It's not a years. recent trend, even though it's something the lay press is talking more about, the Bernie Sanders of the world, the radicals. This last election, it was a big part of the 2016 presidential election. It was, but you have to remember that if it's growing decade over decade, that's cumulative, right? right. So it's going to be greater in 80 than it was in 70, greater in 90 so than Bernie, it was in 80. Bernie's on to something. There's this feeling across the country that the little guy is forgotten. And Donald Trump arose to speak for the forgotten man, a phrase that was used by, I think, FDR. So he recycled it. But Bernie and these folks are onto something. There's growing inequality, and most people presume that is bad. Is it I would, bad? Is I it would bad? say. I, would you make that value judgment? I would say I wouldn't necessarily make that value judgment. I would say it tells us something that we're doing, it tells us what's going on. It's more of a signal, it's a symptom of what's happening, not so much an end in itself or something you want to focus on per se. It's like a rising price of oil. When the price of oil goes up, you have to ask why. Why is the price of oil so much higher than it was before? And we know from the Chicago School of Economics, it's all demand and supply. So you can put all of this growing inequality 
in terms of demand and supply. Is that right? I don't know if we can say all of it, but uh, certainly the vast majority of the story. If you 90%. wanted to say the core of what's going on here, in my opinion and based on my research, is largely a product of the supply and demand. And what's happening with demand? Demand for what, supply of what, what are we talking about? Here? Okay, so the first thing to think about and the first thing to realize is that what's happened over time is we've seen widening inequality throughout the income spectrum. So if you look, take, for example, all the people in the United States, right. r rank them from the lowest income to the highest income, and then say how much have wages increased for each of those groups. So how much is the 10th percentile, which would be the person close to the bottom, how much is what's gone on for the median, what's gone on for the 90th percentile. What's so going on? in this discussion, yeah. remember, CEOs just aren't even part of the issue here, right? We're talking really much more everyday folks. Within that group, within that group, we've seen dramatic increase in inequality with say that 90 plus percentile group going up 40% roughly relative to people at the bottom. Real wages, for example, for people at the bottom of the income distribution are about the same today as they were in 1970. So they're flat for almost a half the century. While wages for those in the top 10%, these are not CEOs, these are, you know. What you, characterizes, what's the most, what's the biggest thing that's different about people in the 80th or 90th percentile as opposed to people in, say, the 30th percentile? What's well, the biggest thing? Two things. One would be education. Education. It, that, that is, you know, you're going to have a lot more college graduates and people with graduate degrees represented in that high income group than you would in the low income group. But what I'm talking about here is not limited to education. If you were to take only college graduates yeah. and ask what's happened to your highest income college graduates versus your lowest income college graduates, same story. Dramatic rise in inequality between the most successful college graduates and the least successful and what, college what, what, Okay, so one difference is did you go to college? On average, if you did, that's going to give you a significant boost, right? In yeah, income. so I'll give you the numbers. Well, what's As the, what's you the go, second factor? No, but let's okay. talk about just the numbers, okay. how dramatic okay. they are. If you were to go like in 1980, a new college graduate would earn roughly 25% more than a new high school graduate. So somebody coming out of school with a college degree would earn roughly a 25% premium over somebody with a high school That's degree. That's a skill or college degree premium. Premium about 25% for having that degree. Okay. By the time we get into the 2000s and where it is today, it's about 75%. Wow, so roughly wow. tripling the premium that people get for and having a college degree. that's what you degree. economists call human capital. Those folks are, if, that, if they're walking around with a college degree, it's as if they've got a lump of capital, human capital, that they're carrying around that's a very valuable asset. Is that right? An increasingly valuable Increasingly asset. valuable That's asset. the way to think about it, is the premium that we see in the marketplace for having more education, but more skills generally, right. is much higher today than it was 30, 40, 50 years so ago. So there's that's what we mean. That's the demand for that kind of skilled labor has been growing. That human capital, that intellectual capital has been growing. And what's the other thing? We mentioned college degree was important, but you said even within a college degree, they're very successful and not so successful. Yeah, so what's that? What, can we describe quality, qualitative? Much harder. What's that is? Much harder. I mean, those tend to get into much less tangible skills. I mean, you know, the easiest thing to measure about somebody in terms of their human capital is their education. Okay. It's a question you so, can ask people quite soon. But if you look at like skills in terms of yeah. whether they're analytical skills, interpersonal skills, all those dimensions of things have become more and more valuable over time. Managerial, mm -hmm. like being able to run a major company, being able to run a company that employs thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, that that, that takes a skill. Yeah. Right? It, How it, do we it, describe it? It means just you went to Chicago booth, you're now a great manager. It's more than that, right? Yeah, I mean, but what the interesting thing is, it's not just the guy managing 100,000. It's the guy below him who's managing managing 500 people or 1,000 people is getting an increasing premium over those people that they're managing. So running a major company is a big deal, and maybe if the CEO is making 400 times more than the average employee at that company or the lower-end employee, maybe he's worth it or she's worth it. Maybe... Is it possible the market's right? I, well, I think the evidence would say that the market looks like it's telling us something real, that okay. it's not an artificial inflation of their pay. And let me tell you the evidence for that. Okay. One is, if you 
you know, some people would say, well, it's all about lot, we've lost control of these publicly, com publicly held companies that boards of directors aren't doing their job of keeping CEO pay in place. The things that cut against that explanation is that in closely held companies or privately held companies where that kind of story really wouldn't apply, we see the same growth. We also see the growth in other very high talent individuals, whether it's sports athletes or media personnel. We're seeing widening inequality, rising wages, rising incomes for the most highly skilled across a wide range of professions. These things, these people have something very unique. The demand is high for that. The supply is low. The price is going to rise. It's, a, it's that simple. Right? It is that simple. And uh, it, like Michael Jordan was not just a skilled basketball player, which he obviously was, but he was a promoter. He was something that people wanted to see and be. So although he was skilled as a basketball player, he had that it factor, right? Well, the other key thing for somebody like Michael Jordan, and the same is true to some extent for your CEO, is that they can spread their talent across a very big market. And as, as the economy has grown, and as communication technology and markets become interdependent, you've allowed people to reap a greater and greater reward. Think about Michael Jordan. He's true, he's a very talented basketball player, he's a very great promoter, but he's selling his product to hundreds of millions of people. If around, each the world, person, around the world. Around the world. If each person is willing to give 50 cents a year That's a lot of money. for Michael <laughs> Jordan. 50 cents though, like a right. candy bar's worth. If Michael Jordan gives me more than a candy bar's worth of enjoyment, that's going to justify you know, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars in income. So Jordan and now LeBron and all of these people, they're, a be they're, they're beneficiaries of globalism. So they're not just doing well in their state or their country, but across the world. These folks are names in India in China, in Russia, in these, you know, vastly populated area where they may be able to get 50 cents and that's enough. Maybe if they'll you get, get five cents. cents. <laughs> if you get five cents from, from everybody in people. India, yeah, yeah, that's right. a lot of money. Yeah, okay, so a little bit more perspective and then back to inequality, but Chicago School of Economics, you yourself graduated from UCLA in 1981, right? That's correct. And that was known by some as a satellite of the University of Chicago School of Economics. You know, there was Rochester, there was the University of Washington. Uh, what am I leaving out? There were a few others. Uh, but, okay, and there was Milton Friedman as this gigantic icon. He had left the University of Chicago at that point, but he came to Chicago in the 50s. George Stigler came here in the 50s. And that's when this place was just a buzz with the Chicago School of Economics. Some would say it goes back to Frank Knight in the 40s, to Irving Fisher, to people like Mintz and Simon, the oral tradition. But the oral tradition was very much demand and supply. We'll, cut, we'll touch on monetary policy and who that was too, uh, but that is the but Chicago monetary School. policy really was demand and supply just applied to money. I mean. It was, it was in Chicago. Price theory is everything and money as Milton Friedman taught it was price theory, right? Demand and supply. Well, that's the big Chicago insight. The big Chicago insight is the same tools we could use to analyze the market for wheat or corn can be used to analyze money. They can be used to analyze industrial organization, antitrust. They can be used to analyze inequality. They can be used to analyze policy issues across the board. It's the view that economics itself, the core tools, are applicable in a wide range of problems. It's this love of economics and applying it to policy. So what is the single most important that comes to mind application of the Chicago School of Economics in the last half, in the last half century? I don't think there is a single most important. Well, I think one. there are lots of them that illustrate that are, the breadth. Give me one. For example, two. take the Volunteer Army. Okay. Volunteer Army is a great example. Volunteer Army was a recognition that the same principles about markets and how markets operate could be applied to something like how do you recruit people to work in the military. Right. It was thought at the time that a draft was necessary, that you needed a draft. Of course, in order we to get always good had drafts. When, in a time of war especially, you had to have a draft, right? No, you had to have a draft that's because said. that's the only way you could get a military 
that would be sufficient of sufficient quality to actually serve the country. But Milton said no, you could do it with the free market, right? Yes, you not only could do it, you could do it much better with the free market at less cost and actually end up with a more effective military force because you'd have a population of people who wanted to be in the military, so who start, chose to be in the military. We started that, I think, in 71. After we had the Vietnam War, which was upsetting people, but also upsetting people was the draft. The Vietnam War and the draft went hand in hand. There was unfairness, there were deferments, there was like, some would call it slavery, inconsistent with a free society. So in 71, they started the volunteer army. People said, you'll never get enough, it'll never work. And now, here we are, what is it, almost 45 years later, and it's working fine. Right? There, were, there were several things that were said. One is you wouldn't be able to get enough people. One is you wouldn't get a high, high enough quality force. Right. And that it would be inherently unfair. And I think as it's worked out, you know, one of the big, some of the biggest skeptics were the military people themselves who felt like, oh, you know, who are we going to be able to attract? And the answer is they were able to attract very good people to the military. The military today has a much more qualified labor force than they would have ever had with a draft. Okay, so they won. The Chicago School won with the Volunteer Army. They won with floating exchange rates? I would say for sure we won on floating exchange rates. I would say Chicago won on monetary policy and the importance of having a stable monetary system. Who figured that out? Well, it really, you know, Milton Friedman was the big proponent what of a monetary rule. What did he do to discover that and, and, and empirically show the importance? Well, he studied how the economy historically had been affected by monetary policy. And in particular, the, 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 what people call, like Galbraith, the Great Crash became known in, at Chicago as the Great Contraction. Yeah. Because I, what had contracted to cause the, in his view, to cause the Great Depression? Well, I, I think he had said that the, the Fed had contracted the money supply, that Which, they had actually reduced the money supply, and that was a big rationale behind in the depression. Like, in what period had they reduced it? That would re period right before the depression started. Right after the economy went down, they contracted so like the money supply. 29 to 33, 1929. And everybody before he studied it thought, oh no, the money supply must have been growing, right? Because that was the apocryphal story, but Milton studied and found no. You know, I mean, it, I'm not sure what people thought before, but what he pointed out was that this, the contraction of the money supply, in his view, played an important role. But he didn't just study the Depression. He studied monetary policy and monetary history much more broadly. And if you look at the evidence, not just from the United States, but from other countries around the world, having an unstable monetary policy is not good policy. So what did he prescribe? He prescribed a monetary growth rule. It basically, you know, thinking of supply and demand, there's always two things you can look at, prices and quantities. That's all there are right. in the supply and demand world. His view was, Let's have a stable monetary supply policy articulated in terms of a steady growth rate of the quantity of money. And people said, surely you could do better. We're so much smarter in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s than they were 50 years ago. So surely the Federal Reserve System with the Federal Reserve Chairman, now Janet Yellen, could do better than a rule. Because Kevin, you are so smart. Casey Mulligan, so smart. Bob Lucas, surely you guys can figure out what's best. You don't want just a rule. Isn't that what people said? Well, two things. One, well, I think you, that's what people said. You're a smart guy, Kevin. I mean, yeah. don't argue with me. No, but I mean, that's what people said. But I think the thing to realize is this. Number one, having something be predictable and people know what the rules are has a lot of value in and of itself. That's what Milton recognized. Secondly, that while people may be able to do smart things some of the time, they're going to do dumb things other times. They're just not going to, they're not omniscient. They don't know everything. And nor are their incentives going to be well aligned. They're not playing with their own money. They're fundamentally playing with other people's money. And if there's something that economics will tell us is people don't play wisely when they're playing with other people's money. Okay, so along came deregulation in the late 70s. Alfred Kahn actually under Carter, but that was a Chicago idea. If you deregulated all these things, you let the free market flourish, airlines would do better, Transit would do transportation, trucking, railroads, all of this. Yeah, all railroads this is a great Chicago example. School. Railroads are a great example. I mean, we, we de you know, the Staggers Act, we re deregulated the railroad business. Productivity in the railroad industry, which had been stagnant for decades, really took off right after deregulation and continued to improve 
throughout the deregulated period. The base, here's again the idea, it's the same model. If you try to regulate the market, you tell people you have to provide high quality service, you have to keep prices competitive, you have to do those things, what you get is not the outcomes you're looking for. You get people playing to the rules and using their rules to their own advantage. So Stigler, George Stigler, your namesake here is the George J. Stigler Distinguished Service Professor. He would say industry capture, that the regulators will be captured by the industry they were supposed to be supposed to regulate. The airlines will take control of that regulatory apparatus. They will use it as a cartel. Luigi Zingales, who's written about that now, crony capitalism is an, an axiom of that. So that was a big insight. And, this, and sort of the, the ability to people to organize, the airlines are few. The customers who are hurt by this are many. This is the logic of collective action, again, a part of the Chicago School. So apply it to the present now. What do you tell Donald Trump? I'm Donald Trump. We've seen 2% growth. Donald says, boy, it sure would be good if we could get 4% growth, Kevin. What should we do? I think, you know, the growth comes from where it always does, which is technological improvement, investment in capital, investment in human capital, and the expansion of markets. So just those are the four things. Okay. And how do you question how do you, is, do how do you get yeah, those? Yeah, how do you do it? Well, first off, technological progress requires people to make investments. People have to be confident about the future. They have to recognize that they're going to reap the rewards of their investments. Same is true with capital investment. Those things are a must. I think what you need to have is a sensible tax policy keep rates low. If one thing we know is that you're going, you know, people respond to incentives. Marginal if, rate, marginal tax rates have to be cut and low? I, I think they, they need to be two things I would always focus on when it comes to tax rates. One, keep the rate as low as you can because every time you raise the rate, that creates a disincentive to do something productive. Okay. Number two, keep the rates equalized across various ways to run a railroad. You do not want to tell people, oh, you'll pay lots of taxes if you do this, you'll pay little taxes if you do that. Guess what they'll do? They'll do whatever you tell them to do. If you tell them you don't have to pay taxes, if you jump yeah. up and down, they'll jump up and down. Doesn't matter how productive jumping up and down is, you pay them to jump up and down, they jump up and down. So keep taxes low, keep the incentives to work, save, and invest high. What else should he do? I think the other side is, we, you know, we, we definitely have to reduce regulation. Regulation is a form of taxation, a particularly insidious form of taxation, because what it does is it reduces people's ability to, again, to do what they know is best for themselves and for the economy. Okay. Anything else to the, get the growth rate up? I think human capital is a big challenge for us right now. K through One, 12 education? I think K through 12 education needs to be improved in the United States. That comes out of your work. That's been published, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Jim Heckman, your colleague, Nobel Prize winner, looking at early childhood education. He'd start before K. That's basically right. the key. Jim would talk about... Start before kindergarten. Yeah. Do you agree? The, yeah, I think that's right. I think the thing about... You get them while they're young. Well, you get them... You start them when they're young. Yeah. Because remember, human capital is a cumulative process. When you're, when you're increasing people's skills, you're always building on what they have already. When a kid enters first grade, you're building on what they did before first grade. When you get to high school, you're building on your elementary yeah. education. When you get to college, you're building on what you came get, out of high get school. Get competition, with. get school volunteer, school choice. You know, it's the same principle again. I mean, you, you know, market forces are powerful forces for bringing what you incentivize them to do. People take the wrong message from the crash of 2007, 2008. People say, well, geez, that, for, that proves that markets don't work. No, it proves that markets do what you incentivize them to do. If you incentivize them to make people goofy loans, guess what? They'll do a very good job of doing it. If you incentivize them to invest in unproductive things, they'll do a lot of that. So he said socialize risk, privatize gain. So that banks did that. They went risk thinking that... Society would cover that, but the game was coming to them, the bankers. Would that absolutely, be absolutely. But it's not change a surprise. Change the incentives. Change the incentives, and they'll do the right thing, right? 
Well, so is is Dodd Frank's the right thing or the wrong no? Dodd Frank is is a is a mess in a couple of ways. So how do we? One is it? is Dodd Frank is a bunch of statements about what we should do without any specifics of how we're going to do it. And if I tell you I'm going to regulate you in some way that I'm not yet telling you, are you going to commit a 30-year investment in the light of not knowing how that regulation is going to actually pan so out? You're need, going to wait and see what they do. We need to repeal Dodd-Franks? You know, I would start. I, I think I think cut it back. Cut it way back. I think okay. we need to decide the things that we haven't done already in Dodd Frank. Hopefully, take some of those off the because table. Because two of those former colleagues of yours at the University of Chicago Economics Department, Merton Miller, Fama, we forgot that a good part of the Chicago School of Economics was revolutionizing modern finance theory, efficient markets hypothesis, and all that stuff. Merton Miller. Eugene Fama, right? Yeah, I mean, again, that's a They place. would be agreeing with what you're saying now. I think so. I think they, in general, were very skeptical about the practical impact of thing, regulatory action, whether it's regulatory of banks or regulation of business more generally. And the or last, individuals. We hadn't mentioned trade. Trump says, oh, trade is bad. We have all of these multilateral agreements that are hurting the U.S. We need quotas. We need to help and protect the industry in the United States and protect the jobs. Well, trade. Did you get that wrong? Yeah. Well, he did, and but trade has a tough time because, you know, the problem with trade, and the same is true actually for immigration, is there are costs and benefits of trade. Economics tells us that the net is is positive. That is, the gains from trade outweigh the cost of trade. But there are people who are going to lose whenever you open up trade. And, and there are a bunch of more people who are going to win. The problem is, goes back to what you talked about earlier. The costs of trade, the lost jobs, are very evident. You see those very clearly because this is the guy who used to have a job right. who doesn't have one. Makes for a great news story every day, every night. The Some new jobs that are created because we're exporting things we wouldn't. The cheaper goods that we all take advantage of when we go to the store, much less evident. They're spread out across the rest of us. But, so. but on net, there's a plus. So you could tell the Donald, look, on net, it'll be a plus. Help some of the people who were hurt. Some of those could be retrained. If they can't be retrained because they're too, too old to do that, we'll help them have a, a, as good a life as you can without incentivizing people to be in the wrong areas. Well, Something I think, like that. I, I think, that, I think that one of the things to realize is the way we tend to adjust to these kinds of changes is not by everybody who used to do activity A that we no longer do switches to new activity B. What you really have is the new people coming in fill those new jobs. And if you facilitate them moving, that'll help everybody else. That is, one of the big problems we've had as the demand for less skilled workers have gone down, we've continued to flood more low skilled workers in the market. If we move those people out, that'll benefit everybody. So we've come full circle. We've got a minute or so left for the show. This is back to inequality. We've said you need to improve K through 12 education. You need to improve early child education. You tell the Donald, look, stop, don't talk about toughening up requirements, promote free trade. He's right. He favors charter schools. He favors school choice. He got that. Marry the two together somehow. More free trade, more competition in schools. Donald, you'll have 3 or 4% economic growth. You'll be reelected. Well, you'll be doing the right thing. We're now 